Good morning, Mount Olive. We want to uh, do our devotions on James today, and we want to tell you to imagine you're at the top of the temple of Jerusalem, and you have been pastoring for many years, and all of a sudden, the chief priest or high priest is behind you with all of his men, and they're screaming at you to denounce that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Looking down at the crowd at the time of the Passover, the streets are full. Instead of denouncing Jesus Christ, you begin to proclaim Jesus Christ died on a cross. Three days later, he is risen. He is declared to be the Son of God by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Confess and believe upon him and you shall be saved. Upon that moment, two of the men rush on you and push you off the temple roof. You fall and it doesn't kill you. So then, uh, and there in all your pain and agony, they begin to pick up rocks and stone you, and you begin to, to pray for them. And all of a sudden, according to the Fox's Book of Martyrs, um, not killed by the fall, but then all of a sudden someone from the marketplace comes with a fuller's club, which is what they would beat their uh, clothing after they washed it. Uh, a fuller's club came and smashed his head in. Um, it's also used by blacksmiths. This is the story of the martyrdom of James, James, the brother of Jesus. And so he writes this epistle talking just about that. <laughs> no pun intended. James, the school of hard knocks, tests and trials. And that's what we're going to look at today, tests and trials. Okay, so let's get right into it because it's going to be lengthy today. I'm just going to tell you. Uh, there's no way around it. I got to set this thing up and we got to do it right. Okay. So first of all, James is unique because it has these one liners, metaphors, and everything we teach on is illustrations. I mean, it is full of everyday life illustrations. What is interesting is that it was written in 45 AD. And if this is the case, and we believe it is, it's the earliest of the new Testament books that was written. The theme again, how to deal with tests and trials, school of hard knocks. How are we going to deal with these trials? The theological points, testing and trials. You find a unique piece in here as he talks about social injustice and inequality among the poor and the rich. He talks about a corrupted faith, and he wants to present a true faith in Jesus. He talks about faith and works in this book. These theological points are going to be the connection points of our ministers, and we're always going to keep uh, reminding you of the theme. How do we deal? with trials and tests. Now the outline by the U version that we're using gives a three part outline, so we'll just use it. The first division that I have the task of trying to cover is the trial of faith. The second division is the characteristics of faith under trials. And the third is how we triumph over faith. Look at that, okay? All right, so now let's get into it. Chapter one, the trial of faith, the trial of faith, the outward test and the inward test. Say that, outward test, an inward test. Let's look at the salutation, which is the introduction. James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad, greetings. We get the author, we get the audience, and we get a statement of doctrine. First of all, it's James, who is a slave, totally owned by his master, existing to do the will of his master, belonging to his master. As you go through your day today, Ask yourself, am I a slave of Jesus Christ? Totally owned by him, existing to do his will, and belonging totally to the purposes of Jesus Christ. Secondly, look at the doctrinal statement. Again, he's trying to talk about corrupted faith and true faith. The Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord means the master and owner of all things, supreme power. Jesus means savior from sin. Christ is the promised Messiah, the one who would come back from the grave, anointed by God. We've got a slave. We've got the doctrinal title. But now look at the author. And this is very important. If you were to ask Angie and Bobby if TJ was the son of God, they would laugh at your face. <laughs> so here's what's important. James was a brother of Jesus. Matthew 13, Mark 6, Galatians 1 and 19. Mary had many other kids married the mother of jesus so james was the eldest of those kids but younger than jesus 
He was Jesus's half brother. He grew up with Jesus. And we have scriptural evidence to show that the brothers did not believe totally and were skeptics. James was a brother skeptic of Jesus as the son of God. So you say, well, what happened to him? Jesus mentions in 1 Corinthians 15 that he made a special appearance to James, just Jesus and James, after he rose from the grave. After Jesus rose from the grave, they were in some room, and he's a hey, bro, <laughs> you know, Jesus, I thought you said, hey, bro, you know, I want, I want you to know, hey, I came back from the dead. I am who I said I was. And it totally changed James's life. James then become leader of the church in Jerusalem, as you see there. And there's the scriptures you can read. Not only that, but they had a new church council where they would talk about the differences of doctrine and beliefs. One such thing was the Gentiles and the Jews. And Paul and Peter had to come discuss before the council. Guess who it was? Guess who it was that led the council? Guess who it was? James. In other words, James went from being a skeptic to a believer. Not only that, but he became, he became, uh, he became the, the pastor of the New Jerusalem church when Peter had to go out to his missionary journeys. And James became a pillar as one who would lead the council, the council of elders. So James is a very important person, okay? And so we see who James is. Now, the audience is to the Jews who were scattered abroad, these Jews that were scattered abroad. What do you mean scattered abroad? When Acts in chapter 8, as you see there, we're reminded that, that Paul, who was Saul at the time, led the Pharisees. And what did they do? They were scattering the Christians. They were arresting the Christians. They were persecuting the Christians. And they were putting them to death. Children from parents, husbands and wives being separated, breaking up your church meeting, breaking it up. Well, so the Christians began to scatter out of Jerusalem, losing their jobs, their homes for the faith of Christ. We don't know trials. Our trials today is nothing like what they went through. They began to leave their homes and their businesses because they wanted to believe in Jesus Christ. Oh, God, raise up that type of commitment in the time and hour that we're living in. And so they were scattered abroad. No doubt began to question, did I do the right thing? Should I believe in Jesus? Should I walk away from my Jewish traditional religion and accept this Christian message? So James is writing to talk to them about hard knocks, about trials and temptations. Okay, so let's get back to our notes here. So that's the audience. Let's look at our two divisions in this chapter. There's outward test and there's inward test. The outward test, what we're facing today, does not compare to what, was what they were facing then. There's an illustration, an illustration in verse 3. Look here, James 1 and verse 3. My brother, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptation or different trials. Different trials. You find all kinds of different trials. Look in verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. The trying of your faith. That word trying right there in verse 3 is the illustration of the testing of silver. So I want you to look at verse 3. I want you to see the word trying. Now I want you to imagine. Imagine uh, a silversmith. And he takes his silver and puts it in the pot. And he heats that pot up. And as he heats that pot up, the silver melts. And when he gets it to a certain temperature, the impurities rise to the top. So then he takes a net and he wipes over and gets the impurities out. And then he does it again. And then he does it again. And he does it until he can look down and see his reflection in that silver. That's what James is telling us, the guy who got thrown off the temple. He's saying, listen, when you come to trials and you come to test, understand God is the silversmith. And he's removing the impurities out of your life. It is a good thing that God's doing. He's using this to make you stronger, and he's using this to make you more pure, more holy. God's design is not to make you happy. It's to make us holy. This trial is not a waste, but it's something God wants to use in our life. God is making us stronger until he can see his very own reflection in us. That's how the silversmith knew. He knew it was 100% pure silver when he could look in there and see his reflection. Just the same in our life. That's what God's doing. God is using this trial, and he's going to bring a blessing. The trials could come through pain, death, sickness, separation, disappointments, emptiness, hurt, greed, accidents, anger, loneliness, cheating, or loss. You're going to face them. They're going to hurt. But a different perspective is that God is using this 
to make me more holy. God is using this to take out the impurities of my faith and to expose them in my life. God is using this to make my faith stronger to the end. Now, what is it that it produces when you take on this perspective? Okay. Verse two tells you count it all joy. You can be glad even in the times of the coronavirus. You can be glad and you can rejoice. All this going on, count it all joy because no God's going to bring an end to it. And God's going to have a, we know that all things work together for good to them who love God and are called according to his purpose. Verse two says God wants to produce joy in your life, knowing that God's still in control. Verse three, God wants to produce patience or perseverance or waiting or endurance. The illustration is this. My daughter, Emma, wanted to run a 5K. So I told her, I said, now we've got to pace ourselves. We never practiced or anything. Well, we get off the starting block and she takes off. We get over here by, by uh, go down and we come up on Lake Street at Big Hill. She looks at me and says, Dad, i got to quit. I say, oh, you're not quitting. you got to keep on pushing on. you got to keep on enduring. You started too fast and you're tired, but you got to keep on enduring. That's what he says. When we go through these trials, get this point. When we go through, through these trials, it teaches us to pace and be steady and to endure through those trials, knowing the finish line is just around the corner. Coronavirus, the finish line is just around the corner. Look at what else it says uh, in verse 4. When it's finished, it'll make you perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That means mature. You know, when you bake a cake, if you just take them raw eggs, that may not taste too good. If you just eat that flour by itself, it may not taste too good. If you just eat that butter by itself, it may not taste too good. But, oh, when you take it all together and you make it into one product, the end of the process, guess what? That homemade bread is something good to the taste. And so that's what we need to be reminded of. The trials may be bitter. This trial may be sour. But in the end, when God brings it together, he's going to make you mature. You're going to be finished product, fully realized the nature of Christ in you, fully realizing the power of the Holy Spirit in you to take you through those trials. Entire, coming to an end, a goal, and blameless. Look what else it says. Now, like this, in verse 5, the key word is wisdom. You know, I can teach a lot of chemistry. Here's the illustration. I can teach a lot of chemistry, and these kids can learn the skills of chemistry. But if they never put those skills to use, it's just knowledge. But when you put those skills to use, it becomes wisdom. The same thing here. In the trials, you take what you read out of God's word, what you learn about your faith, and you have to apply it. And so then the knowledge and the skills become wisdom. And when you have to apply something, you really know it. You're really going to know your faith when you come out of this coronavirus because the knowledge becomes wisdom. God is transforming some, some knowledgeable Christians into some Christians with some wisdom who will be on fire for him. That's what's going on in the coronavirus. Look what it says in verse 6 through 18. Nothing wavering. For he that waveth is like a wave of the sea, tossed uh, with the wind. Verse 7. Uh, verse 8. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Double-minded. I remember we went on our first cruise, or not our first cruise, we took mom and dad on their first cruise. And we said, oh, it is, you know, you won't even know you're on a boat. My goodness, the first night, we were sitting there and it was like the water was sideways in our cups. We were rocking so much. You go up, then you come down. You go up, then you come down. That's what, that's what it's like with people who don't take the right approach to trials. They're up and they're down all the time. They're yes and they're no. But he says one great purpose of going through these trials is God teaches you how to be stable in the bad times. God teaches you how to be consistent. God teaches you how to be anchored. God teaches you how to be strong and stable in your Christian faith. That's a product. That's a product. That's a product of going through trials and testings. You're stable. All right, look at verse 10. Trials and tests bring humility, right? We learn more dependence on God. Who's learning more dependence on God in the coronavirus? Yes, sir. And there's more respect for others, more empathy and compassion for others. That's in verse 10, okay? And so he also talks about a social uh, injustice here, the difference between the poor and the rich. 
And what he makes a point here in the middle of this, there's a connection that I talked about at the beginning of the lesson, is that the poor will be exalted in heaven if they're seeking after the things of heaven. There's another reference to the uh, Sermon on the Mount here, and there's quite a few of those. But the rich who are pursuing things, there's nothing wrong with being rich, but when your life's about pursuing things on this earth, he gives us an illustration. It's like the grass in the hot sun. It's like the flower that soon fadeth away. Everything on this earth will soon fade away. It's only in heaven, right, that will be exalted. So he says, let trials and tests, no matter what loss you have in those trials and tests, let them humble you. That's kind of what's happened in this virus, isn't it? It's kind of what's happened. We've learned that some of these material earthly things don't bring us joy, and that one day they're going to fade away anyways. And so let it cause us to be humble. Look in verse 12. There's a blessing. There's a blessing. Okay. It says in verse 12 uh, that a blessed is the man. And that is a reference again to the Beatitudes. Why? He'll receive the crown of life. The person who faces trials and temptations in this life will actually be crowned with eternal life. What a blessing. What fortune. What a position of favor. And then it says what? that they'll also learn love. We'll learn to love God deeper. We'll learn a deeper relationship with God when we tether our souls to him and we hold on to him through the greatest of trials. That's the first division, the outward test and what it produces. Again, I want you to look at this. Go back and read this. When we take the right approach to testings and trials, the outward test, take the right mental approach, It'll produce some wonderful things in your faith and remove the impurities. Let's look at the next division, the inward test, the inward test. Now, he's very strong on this. He calls it temptation. And look at what he says in verse 13. Let no man say emphatically, emphatically, don't rationalize or justify your own behavior, verse 13. And then he's saying very emphatically, don't blame your sin on God. Sin is contrary to the nature of God, and God never tempts a man to sin. God is not to blame. Don't you dare, TJ, make your sin about God. It's something about what's in you. Verse 13, it's something about what's in you. See, we've made a transition. We talked about the outward test and our approach to those outward tests and what it can produce in my faith, and now he's talking about the inward test of temptation, and he does a very powerful thing here. One of the most powerful things in the Word of God right here, one of the most powerful things in the Word of God is the progression of how temptation brings us to sin and the end result of sin. This is a very powerful scripture, and I want you to get this, okay? Very powerful scripture. Let's look at this. The progression of sin. Now, verse 14, it says, it's not of God, but it's our own lust. It's not, don't, don't make this about God. It's about you and what's in you, and there's a lust in you, a lust, a craving, an urging, or a longing. Here's the illustration. I walk in, and I'm on a diet, and Roz is fixing some homemade cookies. Some of y'all can get this. I've not ate anything all day long, and I know, I vowed, I'm not eating those cookies. Those cookies are bad for old TJ right now. I'm overweight. I'm not going to eat those cookies, but I've not ate anything all day long. You know what happens in me? An urging, right? A desire to eat those cookies. Now, I've said those cookies are bad for me. But if I don't watch it, I'll eat one of those cookies. And that's exactly, we all know what it feels like to know something's not good for us, but to want it anyways, don't we? That is a lust. See, temptation doesn't start with God. It starts with one of those cravings and urgings and longings inside of us. And sometimes those are good, but sometimes those are bad because we're fleshly people. And the and we all know the feeling of knowing something is wrong, but wanting it anyway. Now, here's the second thing. It, now that feeling begins to entice us. We begin to think about it. We begin to plan on it to lure us or draw us away. Illustration. Here's what he's using. We're going fishing. We know in a certain type of area with certain type of water and certain type of growth in the water, we can use a certain type of lure. And that lure will look like it'll be a pleasurable food to the fish. And that fish will boop, 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 swim out and grab that lure. That's what he's saying here. We look at something and say, man, this would be so good for me. There ain't nothing wrong with this. Oh, this will just make me happy. Everybody will be okay. It'll bring me so much pleasure. The desire turns to enticement. 
and we begin to plan on it. We begin to think on it. We begin to let it linger, and that's dangerous because then in verse 15, the progression is it becomes sin. It's conceived. We take the action. We follow through. We get the hook in our flesh, just like the hook in the fish. We should have swam away, but we swam towards. We, should, we swam away from God and towards the enticement. We should swim away from the enticement and back towards God. We have a choice. Go for it or run for it. That's what Joseph did, didn't he? But look at the end result. The end result is death, always. Extinction. That's in verse 15. When it is conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, this is like childbirth. When sin is conceived, it brings, uh, when, when that lust is conceived, we act on it. Brings, uh, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, produces death, extinction of that which is living. It's the illustration of the soul leaving the body. It's the illustration of having a child, and that child is death. Something good, something alive in your life will always die when TJ follows after sin. It's us leaving God's plan. Stop. Application. Here's a good plan for you. First application in the first division. Start taking a different approach towards suffering and trials. Count it all joy. Let it produce those things in our faith. Second application, if temptation attacks my thoughts and I know it's something not good for me, immediately push that out of my mind and focus on Christ. Swim away and swim to him. It's simple. Flee, the Bible says. Second, if temptation comes to my senses, I see something, I hear something, I taste something, I touch something, turn from it immediately. William Barclay says it's something that can be nourished or stifled. If you nourish it long enough, the consequence is inevitable. All right, so let's finish up. So we've talked about the outward test, different approach, producing these wonderful things in my faith. The inward test of temptation and how to have a strategy to overcome those temptations and not get myself caught up in sin. Okay, swim away, little fish. Don't swim towards Finally, let's, he gives us a, a, a thing about God, the source of God, and why God can't tempt us to sin. He says, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of lights in whom there is no variableness or shadow of turning or changing. Every good gift, nature, creation, your job, your family, your provisions, your talents, everything good comes from God, and he's not going to tempt you to sin to go against that. He's the Father of lights. In the midst of the darkness of trials of the coronavirus or whatever you're facing, even if you do sin, in the midst of that darkness, if you look hard enough, there'll always be the light of God to give you the right direction, to bring joy back, to bring confidence, to bring your anchor. And then there is no changing. He'll be this way forever. Like the phases of the moon change, that's the illustration that James uses here. God will never change. He is consistent, he is constant, and he is never changing. And God's will for all of our life in verse 18. Of his own will beget he us with the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creature. God's will for you today is to be born again. Goal number one, I want a different approach to testings and trials. I want to become more and more like Jesus as the silversmith makes the silver pure. God make my faith pure. Secondly, I want to win over temptation, the inward. Help me, God, to stick to my strategy through the power of the Holy Spirit and to swim away and not swim too. I hope you pick you somebody, two or three people. What was the most important thing that hit you today out of devotion? Share that, and I'm going to leave the prayer up to you today. Prayer with your partners. Have a great day, uh, and we we want uh, to say that we hope that, uh, that you feel blessed. Remember, Wednesday night, we'll be going over Revelation, and then devotions again tomorrow. Have a